Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Three Boca, A Ball and Blitzpod. Um, firstly, let me first, straight away, let me introduce you that way. It's all back to front to my uh, co-host tonight, former Western Province fly half, Mr. Anton Chait. How are you, sir? All good, thanks, Andy. Busy, interesting day. <laughs> yeah, well, let's just go straight into that. So, for people, for the millions, obviously, watching around the world, um, <laughs> there's been some very interesting things coming out of Western Province rugby in the last couple of days. So, uh, a very, very short version of an extremely long story is that they decided to um, let's call it Renege, let's call it whatever, ditch a deal with Investec for development on Newlands and Capital and moving forward um, and have decided to go with another deal which involves um, paying back a, a fair amount of money to Investec over the next two years, but also um, completely restructure the way that the development of Newlands will go ahead and way much more than that. Um, <clears throat> so just to be clear, there's two arms sort of to the Western Province Rugby Union. There's the, what we call the amateur arm, if you like, the old school sort of amateur arm, and that's nothing to do with the way it operates at all. That's just um, more about the clubs um, who some are obviously semi-professional, but a lot of them are amateur in the terms that they do not pay their players. And then obviously you've got the professional arm, which looks after the business side of Western Province Rugby Union, um, very much the Stormers, let's call it that, um, and Curry Cup and, along the way. Now, Anton is um, a huge follower, obviously, of Village. He is the former president. He is the former coach. Um, claims he taught Gary Gold everything he knows. Um, but today they got some news because you are in as a club embroiled in this contract. Um, so give us an update on where it is, because I believe you got off the phone to was it to Mr. Maria himself, Zelt earlier? Yeah, we had a we had a chat this afternoon, but it took a while for him to reach me, unfortunately. Um, and uh, the good news is that he's given me and the club comfort that the addendum so to a... what the situation is, Anton. Sorry to cut over you. What's, Sorry, the, uh, what's yeah, the, that, the issue with the club? The club's voted last, uh, on Tuesday evening to dispose of villages in its entirety. Uh, our home ground is called Brookside. And uh, the club's voted to, to dispose of that and to enter into a development agreement with a company called Flight Properties, of which the union would benefit uh, to the extent of 50% of the profits. Um, you know, the last time we uh, dealt with the union on our, on our property, uh, on our lease, was in 2018. So the first time we saw this was um, when we received the, the letter from the union and I've been trying uh, to assist the incoming committee, who are, who are a young bunch of guys, to, given my experience and my responsibility as the past president, to assist them in, in sort of gaining clarity from the union as to what the intent was and whether the previous agreement that we had in place with the union still stood. And, uh, and unfortunately, my frustration got the better of me. And as you saw, um, at the time of going to the vote, the union hadn't uh, got in contact with us, despite me reaching out um, on several occasions. The long and the short of it is that uh, Zalt Maria, the president, has given us the assurance as a club that the amendments uh, to the lease agreement and the improvements that will be made still stand. So uh, we still don't have that in writing. But uh, I don't have any, you know, reason to doubt to doubt it. Oh, that's fantastic news for you, and obviously, like villages is an incredibly historic club, um, and yeah, things like that shouldn't shouldn't happen when there's that much history. So, good news, good news this evening for yeah. you. I hope. Okay. Um, so. Before we introduce everyone, let me just quick, quick, <laughs> let me just quickly uh, thank a few people for tonight's show. SA Rugby fans, Andre from there does a great show. Um, <clears throat> It does a great effort for us with all the graphics that we send out over the week leading up to the show with everyone's pretty pictures on it, um, just not mine and Anton's. Um, and also to our main sponsor, Cape Famous Gin. Everyone's going to be asking me for this now. I'll get some to you, Anton, I promise. Um, Thanks, Andy. Guys, Cape Famous Gin, locally made um, in Pal. Brilliant gin. 
get on to take a lot. They've just knocked the price down to 299, which I'm sure you will agree is a fantastic price for such an amazing uh, premium gin going on. These guys are making a huge wave and we are trying to get it abroad. I tell you all the time, but we are trying to get it uh, over to the UK and Ireland as well as much as we quickly as possibly can. So thank you to them for their support this evening. Right, straight into it. I am going to introduce the first guest to you now. She is a lady who is um, synonymous now with rugby, especially Varsity Cup. I see all the time uh, at Marty's, and she, she may even say hello to me now moving forward. Um, but she is also a radio presenter, TV show host, and on the pitch uh, interviewer after games. Her name is Katua. Hello, how are you, Katua? Hi, I'm honored to be here. Thank you very much for having me. And yes, of course, I will say hi at Marty's. I'm sorry, I'm always so focused on the maroon machine, <laughs> I forget to other people. <laughs> <laughs> Anton, who have we got in second? Uh, we've got uh, Matthew Arthur Pierce, um, well known to <laughs> most rugby followers as uh, one of the best commentators in the world. Uh, Matthew's uh, well known to, to myself uh, as a friend. And uh, I suppose the only glitch on his CV is that he went to a school below the railway line called Bishops. But, uh, <laughs> but other than that, no, Matthew, uh, Matthew is a wonderful human being. Uh, I mean, I can just tell you from a personal point of view that as president of Villages, we reached out to him on a number of occasions and he hosted the Gareth Edwards evening with Cardiff as well as the Eddie Jones evening. And those, uh, I'm not just saying it because Matthew was the MC and he ran the show, but Matthew in my career of attending functions like that those are probably two of the the better ones i've been to so thank you for that matthew um andy how much detail do you want me to go into here he's got quite an impressive cv no let's let's save that let's let's save that for extra time let's call it extra time maybe yeah okay. i think um you, you worry people to be honest when you're on here a lot, of, uh, <laughs> a lot of people that you know that are a bit worried about the stories you're going to tell but um <laughs> So tonight's show is mainly, I mean, there was a, an anniversary of a certain trophy being won in this country 25 years ago <laughs> last week, but um, everyone knows there was only a World Cup in 2003. There's never been another one. Um, but um, it was also the anniversary, 25-year anniversary of rugby going professional. Now, without getting my well-fated soapbox out, um, I tongue-in-cheek quite often say to people, uh, the worst thing that ever happened to rugby is that it went professional. Um, the reason being is we seem to have lost a bit of identity over the years, but it had to. It had to, and it's created a fantastic business, and it's created um, a lot of opportunity for a lot of people. So there was no choice. However, however, we find ourselves at a crossroads during this coronavirus, um, and we every day there seems to be more and more news of people Struggling, club struggling, Manu Tuolangi, but or not, does not have a club as it is of this evening because of um, arguments going with Leicester and with all players at all different clubs. It's not it's a bit hard to single one person out, but we are where we are. And we're going to look back on the 25 years and mainly what it's doing to the system here in South Africa now. We are going to start with schools rugby. Um, schools rugby, as we know, in South Africa is without a doubt the best schools rugby quality wise in the world people of new zealand may argue with me but come to the world schools festival and watch your top schools get 70 points put on them like i did last year and you'll realize that it definitely is the best however that has created a culture a culture of let's call it amateur professionalism um there's stories of drug use there's stories of parents injecting their children um, and now we are talking about the self-proclaimed top eight teams in the country making a breakaway league and telling other schools that when they're good enough, they can come and play against them. So, Matt, start us off with where you see schools rugby at the moment and the, and the system and whether <coughs> it should be supported in, it, in its uh, common, sort of its current guise, or do we get a real, real look at the way that we are encouraging, yeah. let's call them children, because they are, they're minors, to, to take on the burden of school rugby? Andy, let me say this up front. I mean, I'm probably not qualified, actually, to comment on the intricacies of the system, but I'm very happy to share my personal views, uh, which are that, um, I mean, you referred it as uh, what amateur professionalism. Um, 
I, I'd prefer to simplify it and just say I, I believe fervently that there's simply too much importance placed on schoolboy rugby. And that has many different side effects. Um, and one of the reasons it's become so important is because of the the stage of of a, a boy's life that uh, scouts are out there and and looking for talent to go into academy systems and so on and i just feel i mean it, it, it's a good reference point back to what anton was talking about at villages you know what what is what is this whole system i don't think you can talk about schools rugby in isolation because i think what we need to talk about is the pathway from being a, a talented schoolboy rugby player uh, into ultimately achieving uh, the goal of playing for a province of franchise or you know for the the rare few uh, for the national team and and i think what the importance on schoolboy rugby has potentially done is is just break down that pathway somewhat and uh, you know you you get identified so early now that these guys are leaving school they're going straight into an academy system where they've been earmarked for uh, for greater things and and essentially they've been sold a dream they've been sold a story of hope um but everyone's too young and impressionable to know that 12 months later there's another intake who've been sold the same dream uh and the next year there's another intake and and the system can only accommodate so many so those who don't make the grade are very quickly spat out of the system and i it's an ugly word to use but i, I kind of mean it that way and so you get a double hit you get those who, who really were identified early as being very talented who who are lost to the system because there's another generation coming through 12 months later but you've also got those who quite early are discouraged from pursuing their passion for rugby because they haven't been chosen at 16 uh, to go on this pathway um, and th there's no real incentive for them to play after school and and the club system you know has deteriorated and i i would just and I, when i have this discussion i often talk about certain individuals and and i'm going to do so again if you forgive me but I, if people have heard me talk about this before i apologize but you know let me start with francois Lowe, who i conducted an interview with for supersport last week shameless plug there it's going on here next week uh <laughs> reflecting on his career <laughs> after he announced I his love retirement Frank, I can talk about what you want. Right. So, so Flo retired, uh, having played over 50 games for Western Province, over 50 for the Stormers, uh, over 150 in the Premiership for Bath, 76 Test Caps, World Cup winner. And he played under 19B at Stellenbosch. Why? Because he hadn't played Craven Week. Uh, so when he got to Stellenbosch, he tells it quite bluntly on the interview. He said, uh, the coach said, right, who played Craven Week? Okay, you you go over there. Who didn't? You're the other side. Right, we've got enough Craven Week players. You're the 18. And so for his first year at Stellenbosch, Flo said he just loved his rugby. He just played with his mates under 19 Bs at Stellenbosch. No, no pressure. But, you know, it became apparent that he, he really had something quite special. And he worked a little bit harder the next year and, and made the A team the year after, then got invited to provincial trials and so on. Take a, a guy like Damien Delendi, um, you know, who had no opportunity to play against the so-called top schools when he was at school because his school didn't have a, a team that was good enough to play in those echelons. But his coach had a word, I believe Anton might have to correct me, but he had a, a word with Alan Zondach with his academy and said, listen, I think this guy's got something special. Have a look at him. Alan had a look out at Rubek Castile. He phoned John Dobson and said, wow, I really think you should have a look at this guy for Varsity Cup. But what, two, three years later, he was playing for the Springbok. Yeah. And then there's another one who I love talking about who, who played first team hockey at school, never played rugby mm. ever. Went to Stellenbosch, played some Corsace rugby, uh, was spotted, I think, by Marius Skuman playing Corsace rugby, and he's now a seven Springbok called James Murphy. 
you know, never never played rugby at a at a really good uh, rugby school. So, you know, I, I just feel that the system as it is at the moment t probably misses a lot of really good players. And, you know, the other the other person I like to quote who, who had such a lovely time out here with UCT and the Storm is Hugh Jones. You know, his, he used to say how his dad, you know, his dad was a schoolmaster. And his dad said to him, do not specialize. Do not specialize at school. Play everything. Enjoy it. Enjoy the company and the camaraderie of your friends. And time will identify, you know, where you might feel you'd like to specialize. You talk to Jean de Villiers and Skulk Berger now, and some of their best memories are standing in the slip cordon for Paul Jim. <laughs> Not playing rugby. They both played first team cricket. Now, uh, I, I'm told, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm afraid I'm probably not qualified to comment on this. I don't want to say the wrong thing. But uh, I, I believe now that at some of these mainstream schools, if, you, if you're in the first rugby team, you can't play cricket in the summer. You're not allowed to because you're doing preseason. And so on. I, I just think that's really sad. And, and just to finish off, I mean, I, I really get to watch schools rugby, Andy. Uh, because Saturdays don't generally belong to me. But I, I, I went to a game last year sometime before I went off to the World Cup, and I, I was I was really – I'm not going to name names. I'm not looking to stick people away. But I was appalled by the behavior of the coaches, uh, the way they uh, shouted at the referee. And what example are they setting to – as you say, these are boys. I mean, we, yes, we call them young men, but they're minors. They, they're impressionable. Uh, we need to – teach them to be good people um, and and to to behave some of these coaches did towards the referee uh, yeah I mean I, I wrote letters to headmasters and so on as a consequence of that because I was just I was really saddened by what I saw so yeah I'd, I, I'd love to just see I mean it's a, probably a utopian thought but I, I'd just love to see the game played for more of the enjoyment factor. No, agreed, agreed. And I think the, the choices at the end of school, which Anton will go on to now, is, is a real, you've got two ways to go if you're good enough sort of thing. And obviously Varsity Cup is one of those. And I know Anton's a huge fan and I know Secret Tour is as well. So I'll let Anton uh, comment on what, on what I believe should happen at the end of uh, school, I suppose. Well, let me bring Katua in, yeah. Katua, I mean, um, you're obviously familiar with the Varsity Cup format. And I believe there's some interesting changes for next year in that uh, NMMU have been promoted. So there are now 10 teams in the Varsity Cup, Yeah. which means that in the Varsity Shield, there will only be seven. Am I correct? Yes, you are correct. And then, and then two will go down from the Varsity Cup and none will come up, which will make it 8-8. Eight eight. Yes. Something like that. Yeah. 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 Yes, it is. You're 100% okay. right. I'm okay. actually secretly a bit bummed, um, and I'm saying bummed like that, that Madibas are getting promoted is because it was so good value for um, the Eastern Cape to have those local derbies in the Varsity Shield. Um, uh, I was in East London for uh, uh, Wusu and Madibas Roads, and uh, I can't remember what the, I think um, you guys are in. In Fortier, were there, and it was just the chias. It was just it was accessible, and people could go watch and support. And yeah, I'm, so I'm actually a bit bummed that a, a high class or a, you know a, a first class university like videos are getting promoted up again, so that they're away from the the everyday people. But I mean, it was it was very nice to have them there for a bit. <laughs> Katra, don't you? Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Don't you think it could possibly be a good thing for the region in that the kings may now benefit? from having a team in the Varsity Cup and they could maybe align it to their junior structures or the or the academy. Yeah, um, firstly, again, like Matt, um, I, I'm not there at the moment, so I'm not exactly sure uh, what, I'm probably not the right person to ask, but the Eastern Cape definitely needs to sort out their systems of how mm. they are um, handling their players. Because, I mean, as we've seen with um, someone like Mapimpi, he had to go through all the systems and only end up at the Sharks before he, get, he got further uh, to the Springboks. Um, and, I mean, even Apiwe Dianti, I know with his history now and that, but they're all from the Eastern Cape and they're all left. Why? Because there's not something there um, to sustain them or, do they, you know, they can't, yeah. So uh, they need to sort that out first. So even if they have the university in the Varsity Cup um, um, system, they still need to sort out 
their stuff um, in in the systems at a higher at a higher level. Yeah. yeah. Um, then Andy to to and the, and the, and, the, and sorry. No, you carry on. No, but but isn't that half of the issue? Is that once they leave school, it becomes so disjointed. Yes, you can go to Varsity Cup and you can still have a contract with uh, Western Province or whoever. You know, I'm just using. We all go and watch Varsity. Sorry, but like we we see those boys and then all of a sudden ones that uh, you know Chris Smith goes off to Griquas and. I know he's a yeah. cheaters and everything, but there's so much. There's, there's clearly a, a there's a bridge that needs to happen here, because then you've got you've got SA schools, but then you've got SA under 19s, and then you've got who, who's representing who, and it seems really disjointed. And it seems to me that Varsity Cup is trying to bridge that gap, but it can only help so many because so many people are putting their eggs in one basket, and I'm sorry, but it's not just. The students themselves there are parents here pushing and putting all the eggs in the rugby basket and i just think after being involved with varsity cup now and maybe this is a again Katia, a question for you how important is that become not just as a spectacle but as a link for players into professional full-time rugby not only just coming out with an education but also from a playing perspective pressure playing in front of fifteen thousand every every week well, actually, I think it adds on to what uh, Matt wants from schoolboy rugby is the enjoyment factor. And I think, um, yes, there is pressure to perform because in front of a, you know, 15,000 people, you're on television. Um, this is your chance. It's not, it's no of noise. If you don't get signed now in the next four years, you know, then it's sort of like done or whatever. But it really brings back that enjoyment factor. And I think if they let the players because so first you can play one year of varsity cup and then they get signed by Western Province and then they're not allowed to play varsity cup anymore. And that makes it all like, as you say, disjointed a bit. So that is important, but I think maybe the unions and I'm not, I'm, again, I'm not sure as unions and varsity cup need to sit and make, or the universities need to sit down and maybe only sign a player after, I don't know, the third year. I mean, it might be a stupid um, example, but I mean, let them play first because I mean, every season is different and so, yeah, you know, so, it is important, but also, again, it, it needs to be like a togetherness because it seems like everyone's working on their own. But I really yeah. believe in uh, in the whole as a uh, Varsity Cup is a fantastic product and, I, and it's giving them a chance to play. And it's just also for the fans, it's bringing that, like, you get your team to support. Like, with if you're at a university, you have FOMO if you don't go watch Varsity Cup. You literally, you have to be there on a Monday night. And that's what you want for the unions, when they get a curry cup and to super eight, you want those stadiums full. Um, so yeah, definitely there needs to be more chats happening and more collaboration between the two, but it really is important because what do you do after school if there isn't varsity cup? You go play for a club, but I mean, the clubs aren't on par at the moment, or the systems aren't on par at the moment. So yeah, I, I believe in varsity cup. I just think there still needs to be uh, some discussions held. Yeah, absolutely. Joe, Andy, one of, one of the Sorry, One of the gone. development platforms or pipelines for kids leaving school is the Young Gun Tournament, the Young Guns. Now, that mm. tournament, that Varsity Cup Young Guns Tournament is under under threat. I don't know if you're aware of that. Sean Rue's put in a... Yeah. yeah. So, Sean Rue, the S under 20 coach, and this is a very real uh, situation, has put in a proposal to, to the SA Rugby Executive to play a provincial under 20 tournament. Matt, I don't know if you're aware of this, in March and April. And from that, we'll pick his SA under 20 squad uh, for the June, July Rugby World Cup. Now, now that will be disastrous for any young player who has aspirations of playing Varsity Cup or for the young guns. It's disastrous for the universities as well. Um, I'll tell you why, because in terms of the bursary system and the recruitment system, they rely on the young guns to attract players to the university. So I spoke to Nessi uh, today from the Varsity Cup, who's the rugby manager for Varsity Cup. And I said to Nessi, surely there's a solution to this. There are not very many rugby players who are contracted who aren't students. Do you agree? Around the country. You know, guys who, who no, you have turn, to, yeah, I'm listening. In, in for varsity cup, obviously you have to be a student to play varsity yeah. cup. Yes, but yeah. unions contract players who aren't students as well, so they're not yes. studying. Yeah, yeah. 
they they may go to gym in the morning, play PlayStation for the rest of the day, and then do an afternoon session. They don't go to lectures. Those players, and they're very good players in that category, could possibly fill up two invitation sides. And with the 10 teams in the Varsity Cup, the young guns will become 12 teams, and you have two sections of six each. SA Rugby fund the two teams in each section, consisting of these contracted players from the provinces. So they become invitation teams, and they play in the Varsity Cup, and you basically kill two birds with one stone. So 46 players are accommodated who are not students. And that was my solution to the problem. Jeez. <laughs> oh, I always feel like in the rugby world, we're always trying to round a square peg in a round hole or round peg in a square hole. What did you ever say? Um, it just doesn't work. Joe, have you got a couple of comments come up there just for, um, I think there's a couple from Matt maybe on the school stuff. Yeah, we do. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Matt Matthew Watson says, uh, specialisation, the biggest obstacle in school sport at the moment, especially at uh, junior school. Uh, who else have we got in here? Uh, Quentin Ventner says, uh, Matt, I played uh, 013 Alpha. Need to explain that one for uh, the non-South African viewers of me thinks. Uh, for a big uh, rugby school in Paul, the pressure from parents, uh, your school and other learners at that stage are even crazy. You are treated like a first team player. Our uh, team talk before into schools was done by Mornay Duplessis for kids 12 and 13 years of age. Wow. And, and uh, finally, uh, Ryan Baske, so good evening, Ryan says, again, uh, Humpson schools need to either limit or clearly define the roles of the coaches, especially outside coaches, who uh, by default focus on winning at all costs. Andy, back to you. Yeah, but just on that last comment, though, <clears throat> if the school gives the brief and is going to pay let's pay through the nose for a coach to leave an academy set up with the you know it, it, that that unfortunately is where it where schools rugby is now isn't that right Matt I mean like they're they're taking lines look at look at boys high here in Pal uh when Sean Fenter left I think it's Sean Erasmus left Sean Erasmus left and they I, I, all sorts of figures being touted around for the coach but his job description is Go and win rugby matches and go and win into schools. And that's as soon as you put that pressure on a coach who's willing to take that job, then surely that's just going to filter straight through to the players. Is that not, Matt? Yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Right, let's move on. Anyway, so right. after Martin <laughs> Um the, the other option out of school, obviously, is to so academy wise um and if anybody's got any insight into this i believe that you know they do offer education stuff but as we all know the old cliche is you only one leg break away from the end of your career um i used i use this example quite a lot there's a fantastic rugby player from, from boys a couple of years ago called Ivan Rus, who is actually succeeding at the moment with the sharks i think he just won the young player of the year um for the sharks so brilliant awesome great example Myself as an 18 year old would never have coped with that at all um, and would have probably gone off the rails unbelievably. But um, has anybody got any insight into to what happens at an academy, uh, a super rugby franchise? And, you know, how well are these 18 year old lads, men supported? Anton. Yeah. So, so the Western Province Rugby Institute no longer exists, Andy. It was an 8 million rand a year cost to the union, and they've done away with it completely. The few kids that they accommodate um, who are not students, in other words, they're not in the Marty's UWC or UCT system, but they are contracted to the union, get accommodated at the Western Province Rugby Academy now, which is a commercial venture not run by the union. It's run by a company called UXI. I don't know if you've heard of them. And they've bought the Free State Academy, um, uh, the Stellenbosch Academy, the Western Province Academy, and I think one or two others uh, countrywide. Parents pay quite a big uh, number to send their, their kids there. Um, and obviously those that are contracted to Western Province will, will be paid for by the union. And those, uh, the Sharks, a uh, similar system, except they, they own the academy and they run the academy 100% uh, themselves. Um, 
and they will offer scholarships and bursaries to kids. Uh, but the majority of the uh, academy recruits are paid for by parents to make it a viable business model. And Andy, those, I, so, yeah, sorry, Matt. I hate to sort of hanker back to the, the old days, but, you know, I, I was having a chat with uh, Anton, I hope is going to love this. Uh, but, you know, in, in solving these problems, I mean, sometimes, uh, I guess probably later on, we're going to get into uh, how much fun touring is and so on. And why, you know, why is the Lions tour so successful? Because it's a it's a tour, you know, it's as simple as that, you know, three tests, uh, midweek games, you know, it, it, there's just so much going for it. Now, similarly, yeah, we took, you said 25 years ago, we took our first steps down the road towards professionalism. I, I think the best thing about leadership, right, is is owning mistakes and, and learning from them and, and saying, okay, well, maybe we went a little too far down this path. So maybe we must beat a retreat and, and go back to the previous fork in the road and go down there. And I was chatting to Gus Pichot uh, in Japan. Um, I did a series of interviews with with highly decorated international rugby players from a variety of countries and i i actually saw him his his eyes misting up when he spoke about how he grew his passion for rugby and that was when he was living on the outskirts of buenos aires and on a saturday morning he and his brothers and his cousins would go and play for their club uh, for the club side and their rugby club was the focal point of their community and they had age group teams at the club on a Saturday morning and they'd nip home for lunch. And then he said, in the afternoon, we go back and watch my father and my uncles, you know, playing for the senior teams, whether it was the fourth team or all the way up to the first. But again, it sounds a little bit utopian, but, but you know, rugby is, is a game, as we know, for all shapes and sizes and uh, heights and weights and uh, players of, of varying skill. And, but it is by its very nature, then something that brings different people together. It's a community game and, and to have a rugby club that is a sort of focal point of a community um, is in my opinion, it, it, it's a, it's a good thing, right? It's a, it's a, it's a place of safety and a, a place of camaraderie and uh, of good habits. Uh, hopefully, uh, even if your side loses, but um, and and that's to a large extent that has been lost. Um, yeah. And again, without wanting to say, oh, let's go back to the, the so-called good old days. I mean, there's a lot to be said for that, and and providing this this peace uh, between being a yeah. talented schools player and possibly a professional player. I mean, the analogies I used of those players earlier really sums up that old saying, if you're good enough, you're old enough. And if you're good enough, you will make it. If you're that good, yeah. you will get seen somewhere. Uh, mm. And those three examples that I gave earlier, Francois Lowe being one of them, it, it just proves that point. Damien Delendi, but yeah. James Murphy. But if we can fill that gap uh, with a with a viable club system where there is, the, even within the club, there is uh, a progression that you can make, even if it's through age group or uh, and and into your into your senior levels of club rugby. Yeah, Katur, can you hear us? Because I know you're having some trouble with the sound. They've lost a bit. Cut to it. But yeah, just to just as a sorry, Jake, go on. Yeah, it's okay. I'm just picking up there. At, um, I can hear everybody perfectly. Okay, so so uh, just crack on where you are now. Lads, it's coming through. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Cut to it. Can you hear us? All right. No. No, it's good. Anton, do you want to just sort of embellish on that? Because I'm the sort of yeah, person. Yeah, exactly look, I think Matthew. Said, uh, I think Matthew's hit the nail on the head. I grew up going to rugby club. That's what I did. Yeah, <laughs> I think Matthew's hit the nail on the head. Sorry, and, can't and hear, guys. <laughs> we can hear you. Do you want me to carry on? Be fine. Go on. Yeah, please, Anthony. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think Matthew hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, the community clubs, uh, uh, you know, being successful. And I, you know, if you look at clubs in the Western Cape, the successful clubs are exactly that. It's where it's where the family feels welcome, where they feel safe, where they where they enjoy the entire day. It's a it's entertainment for the day. And clubs like Tigerberg and False Bay and uh, uh, Brackenfell, etc. They've really put in a lot of effort to get to that point, and they and they're successful and they're doing well. And, the, and you've got to give their committee and their members credit. I believe we have just way too many clubs in the Western Province to, you know, to ever be successful here in terms of our club structures. Um, we've had this discussion before, I think, Andy. You know, clubs need to merge. There need to be fewer clubs. You can't have four clubs in one street in Paul, for example. It's just, it doesn't make sense. Um, but Andy, I want to, you know, there's some guys who've made some very good comments here. This Gary van Lochtenberg chap, he talks about a player yeah, from Stellenberg who's caught up between the Kings, NMMU and SAS, which is the, the Stellenbosch Academy of Sport. And yeah. uh, this kid's obviously, uh, you know, traveling between Port Elizabeth and Stellenbosch. And uh, he's not very settled, it seems. You know, and these kids aren't commodities. They are human beings. They need to be treated, you know, properly. Yeah, so, and to... Yeah. A, a massive, a, a massive point that gets made by the Springboks, uh, who were successful, Andy, at last year's World Cup. There was one in Japan, 2019. Maybe you heard about it. Um, <laughs> I watch it all, hear your commentary, um, so, times in the last six months. So, um, <laughs> no, you were just saying you hadn't seen one since 2003. So I was just picking up on that. Um, no, so, the only World Cup that's ever happened. <laughs> But, you know, there was such a common theme around uh, Russ C. Erasmus and his management staff, you know, his belief in picking good people uh, as opposed to necessarily just good players. Yeah. And this is this this is a, a further part of my concern. And I, we must get off the concern soon because, this, you know, uh, we want to have some fun as well. But, uh, you know, part of the concern is that, <laughs> that you create this level of expectation in a young, in a, in a boy the young man at the age of 15 or 16 and and the vast majority of them don't actually make it through the whole way to the system so for the vast majority the experience is one of ultimate disappointment having been uh, almost i don't, I don't want to say sold a dream but having had the taste of a dream yeah. uh, and the pressure that came from parents and from school coaches and and self-inflicted pressure uh the, the build-up of all of that um you, you've got to be a very very strong personality to cope with that and come through on the other side uh, a better person mm. yeah i mean and, 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 i mean some of these guys have gone to montpellier in toulon at the age of 18 i just can't, i can't actually get my head around who's advising that and believes I mean, someone from Afrikaans going to English or English into an Afrikaans would be hard enough. I mean, but to go <laughs> to go that far must be um, must be crazy. But we um, we are where we are now, and we are now at a point. Of, obviously, look, we're to where they are. The world champions, all jokes aside, and um, the national game's good, but more and more players are unfortunately leaving um, due to money. Um, whether it's for sabbatical or more permanently. Um, and then we've got this thing going on at Western Province at the moment um, between essentially an amateur arm, let's be honest, um, and a professional arm. And I suppose, uh, are, are we actually in a better place now? Have we? And, and if we aren't, then how do we move forward? Anton, you've, you've been involved so heavily with both sides of it as a player, then obviously you went through that transition as a coach into, um, you know, you coach Western Province um, and, and then onto villages or whatever. How big has that change been? Has, have we not adapted properly? Have we adapted properly? Where are we now? And is there light at the end of the tunnel that? And if I believe, sort of, uh, I believe that the only real the solution is to amend the Saru Constitution, allowing for 100 percent 
ownership of the of the provinces. And once you get that investment into the unions and it's run by private investors, you'll see a different a different model, a different product. Uh, the clubs will be totally amateur, run by amateurs, um, obviously administered by the union in terms of the leagues and the referees, etc. But the Stormers and the Western Province professional rugby players will be part of a private entity, like, mm. like in France or in, uh, in England, in Wales and Scotland, etc. But that's scary, isn't it? We're at the hands of others. We've, we've allowed the, the control in our game to be put in the hands of others, and it's, it's worked in some areas, but it's, it's not working in others. Are we one's bitten twice shy, Matt, or are we, are we on the right track or not? Oh, jeepers. I, 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 don't, I don't know, Andy. I mean, you know, I don't know a heck of a lot about the way the game is run in the Northern Hemisphere. We all talk about, um, you know, players running from here for, for, for more money. But, you know, I'm now seeing salary cap being reduced in England. I'm reading that only one club in the Premiership is actually viable uh, in terms of profitability as a business. I mean, and and... I dare say the top 14 in France is probably a, a similar statistic. I mean, we instinctively, we know that, that the vast majority of these foreign clubs are, you know, they're propped up by wealthy benefactors. Uh, you know, if they were supposedly run as, as businesses, uh, <laughs> You'd uh, your your investors would take a good hard hard look. This is why I'm fascinated by the entry of of CVC as a private equity business into mm. uh, in into rugby in England because you know the, the, there's a profit motive <laughs> as a as a private equity in, in investor you know, and and your motive is profit yeah. Un, un, yeah. unashamedly so. So it's going to be fascinating to see how you you actually construct something there given what we've just said that 13 out of the 14 clubs i think it is or 11 out of 12 what is it anton that are uh, simply not they're not profitable yeah and that we know that is a fact it's published yeah. so it's ex exeter eh? exeter is the only one yeah. that showed yeah, yeah exeter chiefs are the only one that's called profit yeah. yeah everyone thinks they are owned by tony Rowe, but they're not actually they're owned yeah. by the fans they're actually a fully all-inclusive club who have built from the ground up and so is that extremely is, well is um, that not the lesson then andy right there <laughs> yeah potentially i think there's a i think for me there's a there needs to be a middle ground found where i was dead against cvc coming in like at first obviously just being like don't touch my game in in the uk and all this but then you look at it and you look at the people running it and they're not singling people out and you look at what's happening behind the scenes in the papers people are suddenly getting teflon shoulders and not shouldering you know not shouldering any responsibility and we're still for all these years at a massive impasse we still will never get this global calendar no matter how good we all believe it's going to be because the uk will go we don't want to play rugby in the summer it's as simple as that they just don't want to do it so and why should they like all jokes aside why should they it's like you know to appease everybody else it's like everyone's going mother well, six nations need to give everyone a bit bigger piece of the pie why it's their competition. They created it. It's their business. It's like me running a successful business and you coming in and going, I'll give us 10% of that because you're doing really well or not. Like, it, it, but CBC, I'm just worried that they, look, when they ran, they took over Formula One, they 10, I think by the end of it, they took out more than they, they put in and, um, and what have you. But at the same time, somebody professional needs to come in. I'm actually really interested to hear um, Katura's view on how the games merge not in any sort of condescending way but your window is, is shorter than, than anton's up there of knowing <laughs> the amateur game to the professional game but how have you seen it change are we heading in the right direction because it doesn't seem to and you know what's the way forward that we can all just enjoy rugby again without so much flipping politics across the globe i'm not even just saying south africa 
Yeah, well, I'm just going to go from um, where uh, I grew up. I grew up in the heart of the Eastern Cape um, in East London. And um, the, the only play, the time we would get an international game, the Springbok game would be like, I don't know, every like maybe third or fourth year. Uh, and then it would be like against Uruguay, Italy. Not that there's anything wrong. It's just like, it's not the All Blacks. Um, so just in terms of that, um, from the Eastern Cape, from a small where probably most of the rugby lovers maybe are. Like, I mean, how many people on the Eastern Cape? Everyone wants to see them, but they don't have they don't have access to the Springboks, and then also not to a provincial team. Which makes why do I support them? Why do I go watch it or what? So I think accessibility is one. I think maybe I don't know if you've mentioned this. Maybe when I cut out because of my glorious internet, but just in terms of like getting back into the communities um, worldwide, I think that's like. Um, I think we said in, in Engl English is um, my English has left me is as yet it quick thy loyalty quick um. Cultivate. 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 Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say bye, Danke, Matthias. Um, cultivate <laughs> um, that, that loyalty uh, at home, and then it filters like that. Because, I, I mean, my mom was in East London when the Springboks did their tour uh, through, through East London, and it was absolutely insane. And I know they were rugby World Cup winners, but, I mean, it was just the way people, in, like Mapimpi and Sia Kilisi, um, they were everything. They were like, they are gods there. And that I've never, ever, ever seen that before. And I know I'm like super young compared to all you wise people here, but I've never, ever seen that in the Eastern Cape. And so I just think going back to put, put. Thank you. Uh, putting it back, going back <laughs> into the communities, like, I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. And also not like to have like sky high prices, only have it now and then. I'd rather have a, a league that's on maybe on a Sunday, family day, once a week, than only have one every two to three years. So yeah, I just think going back to the community yeah. I think would help in terms of just the, yeah, the, just the fan the, base and the loyalty. Yeah. yeah. Just a genuine question for you, Matt. Do you, you get to a point now where you, you've, you've got a game on a Saturday and you've picked whatever game it is and you're like, really, really? I've got to go to this. Whereas in the, in the past, every game was like, I'm not saying that you don't enjoy it. I'm, I'm just, like I'm sure you get enjoyment out of it, yeah. but in the past every game was big, and now yeah. like I use the analogy like who wants to go and watch Connacht versus Kings on a wet Sunday in North in Southern Ireland? It's like it's not attractive to go and watch. Sorry, but it's not unless you support those teams. So bring back the big derbies, bring back the big matches, bring back a big Curry Cup is what I say, but it's not as easy as that. But are you are you seeing now? Other than like obviously the big tournaments, which you I'm assuming live for the British Lions come next year, amazing. But do you ever find yourself thinking, really, I've got to go and commentate on this this week? Not, not really. Um, I, I'm a bit of a rugby tragic though. I just I, I love what I do. Um, to me, <laughs> as a as a broadcaster, those so-called smaller games are actually a lot more challenging. As a broadcaster, you know, the, the yeah. I reckon the toughest gig, I defy any broadcaster in the world to find a tougher gig than Craven Week. Yeah. Uh, where as a commentator, you're doing three games a day, some days, and uh, with 46 young men per game, none of whom you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> and their parents are watching and they're, uh, their grandparents and their uncles and their aunties are all watching. And if you call uh, Peter, Peter uh, Anton by mistake, uh, Supersport gets a call from the auntie who says that you've now cost uh, her nephew the, uh, the, the SA school selection because you misidentified him. I mean, it's a tough gig. Yeah. Whereas a, spring, a Springbok All Black Test match is, is it's almost second nature. You know, you you instinctively know all the players and so on. Um, I mean, I do think one of the things that has cost us in a way, in a bizarre way, and this is also something to think about. I mean, I I've, I've been very impressed going to watch. I mean, <laughs> talk about being a rugby tragic. I, I was I was. This is an honest truth. I was uh, I was on a tour for a month with the Springboks in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, finished up with a game in Cardiff, I think, on Saturday, the 2nd of December. I'm going back a few years now. 
And I was staying on for a couple of days in London to do business. So I woke up on a Sunday morning after being on a rugby tour for a month. And I, I went onto the internet and said, where's there a game on today? And, and Harlequins were playing Saracens at the street. So I phoned, I phoned one of the BT sport guys, Nick Mullins. I said, any chance I can get a ticket or a pass for this game? And he said, sure. And I, you know, it was pitch dark, 3.30 p.m. I jumped in an Uber and I went and I watched Saris oh, play Harlequin. I was just thinking about this. I mean, it was pretty brilliant. But, you know, and then what struck me is that the atmosphere was, was pretty primal, <laughs> actually. It was uh, pretty aggressive, um, very close to the field and so on. And, and then this public address announcer came on you know, 10 minutes from the end. Thank you very much for your attendance today. We've got a record crowd at the stoop, 12 and a half thousand people. Yeah. And, and it, all kind of, it all made sense to me why it had been so great. You put 12 and a half thousand people in Loftus or Ellis Park or whatever, it looks like nothing. Um, but you'll often get 12 and a half thousand people at a Curry Cup game. But I, sometimes I think we're a victim of our stadiums. Yeah. <laughs> which, are, which, which don't... But. But Which just, to, just, to play, just to play devil's advocate, they must have been built that size because at one stage there was an appetite to fill a stadium that big. Yeah, that's not really playing devil's advocate. I mean, you know, there was a time, <laughs> uh, maybe you don't remember, Andy, uh, you know, pre-19. pre, pre do, you, do, you, do, you, do you then go, right, we, we ditch Loftus and we build a 12,500-seat stadium? No, I'm not saying you do that, but I'm saying it's a challenge for the game because mm. you know you are left with these mm. legacy stadiums i mean look at look at england i mean england play their test matches you know but, but, you know part of our legacy is now we want to take test matches all around the country so we need big stadiums all around the country we had the fifa world cup england's got twickenham mm. as far mm. as i'm aware they played one game in 2015 uh, world cup in manchester one game um and in case you'd forgotten, they were out of the World Cup by then, Andy. But anyway. Um, <laughs> no, wasn't that the World Game either? Definitely wasn't there that day. No, but uh, this is just banter. But, 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 you know, they, they've got one big... I knew I shouldn't have started this show with Joe. I knew I shouldn't have done it. One, one big rugby fortress called Twickenham. Um, whereas, you know, we, we take our test matches around and our, our franchise and so on. And, and, and it's still the... To your point, it's still the derbies that fill fill those stadiums mostly, yeah, and and, and mm -hmm. results. Um, so yeah, there's just a couple of thoughts. Yeah. There. Andy, if I could come in, uh, Katua, yeah, I yeah. think you made a good point about the Eastern Cape crowd identifying with the Springbok team, and I think we need to see more of that in the South African rugby environment. In fact, where where there are successful tournaments or competitions in the world, the spectator identifies with the team that they support. So let yeah. me give you an example, Varsity Cup, for example. A student at, uh, at Pucker will identify with his team and he'll support his team no matter what. They're there every Monday night through thick and thin, win or lose, they're there. It's portainment. Francois Pinot has created a product and it's successful. Okay. With... With Super Rugby, the competition is flawed. The structure of the competition, it's confusing. It's uh, conferences, it's local teams playing against each other. Nobody knows what's going on. All of a sudden, there's a quasi quarter final, then a semi final, and a final. And I think that, Matt, I don't know if you agree, but uh, Katur can come in here. That competition needs to be simplified. Oh, lost Katua's audio. Hmm. No. <laughs> no, it's no, no audio it's from Katua. Right, there. There's, um, need to log out and log back in again, Katua, I think, please. Um... Yeah, go on. Go on, Matt. You pick up the combo there. Yeah, you know, I think... <sighs> Sure. This uh, my view is is a fairly simple one on Super Rugby is is that I do think that at a point when that conference system came in, 
it effectively, this is, and again, please, this is my opinion. Uh, <laughs> uh, it effectively gave Australia a domestic competition. Remember mm. when we started giving away mm. trophies for conference winners? Yeah. And, you know, New Zealand had the NPC, uh, which is now what, MITRE 10 or whatever. We had Curry Cup, but Australia didn't have a domestic competition and suddenly they had a five team domestic competition with home and away derbies wonderful for australia but what it did is it just you know created uh you know home and away super rugby derbies in south africa and new zealand plus essentially the same team is not quite but franchise versus provinces playing each other in curry cup as well um and there wasn't enough to differentiate but in the meantime australia gets a five team uh, home and away derby domestic competition which they never had so at, at that i think that's it was at that point where i mean if you if you listen to what fans are saying it's that's the point where fans started to get lost yeah uh, in in the system yeah so you'll be waking yeah. up tomorrow morning matt for the an Australian derby, yeah. Definitely. I, I, I listen at, at this point. <laughs> this long, this long into lockdown, even uh, I promise you, an Australian derby is enough to get me up. Good. Oh. Okay, back to you, Katua. <laughs> you, I, I asked you about the, the, you know, the. I gave you the Varsity Cup as an example. Um, yeah. No, uh, gone. She gone again. No sound words. She hasn't muted herself, has she? <laughs> She's gone. Joe, do you want to bring up a couple of comments in the uh, meantime, mate? Yeah, hi. Sorry, I was uh, just enjoying a piece of uh, stick of drovers there. I'm really embracing this uh, South African thing this evening as well. All I'm missing is a good pinotage. Uh, Quinn Benter says, uh, uh, saying all of this, uh, pressure or no pressure, currently schoolboy rugby and Varsity Cup are the most entertaining rugby in South Africa. Why? Schools and Varsity Cup games get more support than uh, from a super from a super rugby game. Interesting point. Uh, Gary van uh, Logrenberg, uh, which Anton mentioned before, one of our players uh, played for South African schools uh, last year out of Stellenberg High School. He's been contracted by the Kings for Pro 14. Um, he is caught up between the Kings, I'm assuming NMMU is a university, and the SAS, ooh, brave man, uh, travels between <laughs> PE and Hot Elizabeth and Stellies. Um, how does he even settle and focus on one team? Big ask at the age of 19. Uh, there, and Rion Silius, Kilius, forgive me for that one. Um, I, uh, he coached a club, a club would be at San Jose, a rugby club in Paraguay in 2018. Every Saturday and Sunday, the stadiums are full. Clubs are owned by wealthy by a wealthy businessman, so therefore it can work. But it does go to show that I think that you have something very special that other places don't have in the world at the schools and varsity level. Andrew, back to you. Yeah, no, I think it's um, it's there's been so many valid points brought up tonight, and it's great to get so many people's views, especially people who are still involved with uh, rugby at all, all levels as well. But my final question, and uh, Anton, you can jump on this. I think I've probably asked you a hundred times before. Lockdown finishes tomorrow. We go back to rugby across the globe. Everyone's filling in the stadiums. What's the lesson that we've learned? What lessons should we be taking into, uh, into the game moving forward? I think I think that worldwide there's been a reset. Matthew alluded to it earlier on. Clubs are are cutting, uh, com countries are cutting uh, salaries. Um, there's been almost a humbling, um, and I think there's going to be so much more appreciation for the game. I mean, I I just can't wait to see a live rugby game, uh, personally, oh. and I think we're all going to just appreciate those Saturday mornings on the touchline or going to Newlands to watch a Super Rugby game or whatever. And uh, and it's not just uh, South Africa. I think worldwide, uh, people are going to appreciate the game far more. Brilliant, Matt. Yeah, I think uh, don't we all think that that what we're currently going through has given us perspective on so many different things, uh, not least uh, how we view our sport, how we consume it, how we miss it. 
Um, and I, I do think uh, things are going to change. I mean, I know when, if, if I talk from a South African perspective, you know, uh, when Rassi came back as director of rugby for Saru, he came from Munster and I had many chats with him. And I said, what's the single biggest thing uh, you learned uh, from being in Ireland. And he said, I, I learned that you can get to being the number one ranked side in the world, which I think they were briefly, albeit briefly. Uh, but, you know, they were consistently number two in the world, Ireland, for a while with 180 professional rugby players. Um, and yet South Africa, we, we tend to, you know, contract, contract, contract. Uh, and, and actually, um, there's not enough in the pie to go around. And I know that's going to be a key focus going forward is that old adage of uh, less is more, you know, let's have fewer professional players. Let's uh, make it more attractive for them to stay in South Africa. I mean, if I, if I think about the number of Springboks that I've spoken to over the years, who've had a good stint uh, in Europe and just small things, Andy, small what sound like small things you you're in france uh in your first two months you've got a small child uh the child gets sick go to the chemist the chemist can't speak english because you're in way down south uh refuses to diagnose your child for you know for reputational reasons you can't speak the language you can't converse you just day-to-day -day stuff about living you know in a in a in a foreign land with a foreign language, not easy. And, you know, I, I think if there was enough incentive, certainly financial incentive, it wouldn't have to be uh, ran for ran the same um, to, to encourage our top players to stay here because add in the lifestyle component and, and that feeling of being home. I mean, there's a number of our top players whose families have come home to South Africa while they played out three-year contracts overseas because mm. the family just didn't feel at home uh, where, wherever they were in the world. So I do think there's going to be, and, and if anything, as Anton says, there's, that reset will be accelerated by what we've gone through now. Um, and hopefully that leads to a, a long-term better outcome. Fantastic. Katua, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yes, back. we can. Oh, you get the final could, say. You get the final you, word because you, you keep could disappearing. You, could you pick up your guitar and sing us something just to it's, see if we not, can? It's not my guitar, though, Matt. It's it's <laughs> other people's guitars. <laughs> no, sorry about that. I, I think it's my new earphones. I, I try to be fancy because, you know, it's Matthew Pierce. You have to be fancy when it's Matthew Pierce. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I did my first varsity cup game with Matthew Pierce. It was the day that um, U.S. Fonavesa has passed away. And I remember Matthew came to do a little tribute for uh, U.S. And I was so nervous. But anyway, now it's, I'm over it now. So, um, no, I just in terms of um, I really believe that um, if you're able to get the people to – your community rugby clubs, the enjoyment factor will be there, the players who want to play, uh, and, and hopefully that will make it more attractive for commercial side as well as they go up, all of that. So, um, yeah, I, and also players to stay is like we know what's happening at the Sharks. The players are actually staying because the environment is um, – they want to stay. Like I know my PP said uh, didn't, uh, didn't take that massive deal he originally had from Japan, which says something. So, I mean, there's that something changing – at the union so let's hope that continues especially after COVID-19 but yeah I'm excited to see some live rugby again but South African live rugby I can live without the Aussies it's fine <laughs> yeah 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 that's not going to be the best watch tomorrow morning <laughs> right guys thank you so much I think we've successfully put half of the rugby world to rise tonight and I really really appreciate your time Matt Katua thank you so so much Anton thanks for adding your values always again Hopefully, fantastic news for villagers today that uh, things won't change too much. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Obviously, this will stay live on Facebook for quite some time and will be on the YouTube channel uh, tomorrow. Um, so uh, the other thing is there will be a brand new Facebook page purely 
for three bocker, not just for three blokes of ball and bard. So we will have our own home moving forward and that will come in the next week or so, which is really, really cool. So that we can post some 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 really sort of South African centric uh material on there as well as obviously all the live shows, which means you don't have to scroll through um everything else that uh, Joe and the team are doing wonderful things across the globe with rugby and everything. And just a reminder that um, at 8.30 on Tuesday night, um, this is very much Springbok rugby related. Uh, blah, blah, too much wine. This is, Katia, this is your fault. I'm drinking wine too much. Um, <laughs> and um, yes, Mr. Dan Fansay, who obviously heads up uh, Rugby Academy Ireland, will be doing a live show at 8.30 UK time. 9.30 here in South Africa. So go to the Three Blokes of Ball and Bod page on Facebook and you will see the link there on Tuesday. And that's Dan and his team are doing amazing stuff over in Ireland there, so it's definitely worth a watch. Plus his next spring box, so why not? Um, guys, thanks so much for this evening. Thank you, Anton. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Katua. Thanks, and uh, we'll see you again in a couple of weeks' time with another live show. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye.